Hello, and welcome to the Change Fail Podcast with Kevin Brennan and Julian Sammy. Today's episode one beta is about changing change on May 13th, 2016. Hi, Kevin. We're live. Hi, Julian. How are you? I'm doing okay. This is kind of fun. This is our first podcast, and we're going to get to talk about a bunch of different topics, but the, the main purpose here is to talk about the nature of change, how businesses transform, and how they fail to transform. Thus the name, change, fail. So, right. why don't you introduce yourself first, and then we'll get more into a conversation about, you know, about the nature of uh, some fails, uh, failures to change and some change failures. So, all right, well... As Julian said, I'm Kevin Brennan. Uh, I am a business transformation consultant in Toronto, Canada. And, you know, the obvious question most people ask is, what does business transformation mean? And, you know, business transformation is, of course, about change. In particular, the kinds of change that are forced on you by big disruptive changes in your environment, such as a new competitor coming on board, a shift in technology, uh, or even true disruption in the Clay Christensen sense of new technologies and business models that render old ones obsolete. And I've been working as a in this space for about 20 years, uh, starting off as a business analyst and project manager, then with IIBA, and now as an independent consultant. Julian, over to you. Oh, so I've been uh, doing business analysis and, you know, design thinking work for, gosh, I guess about almost 20 years now, too. Although I started off as a as a coder and a developer and eventually got into doing a lot of uh, more senior strategic work. It's been a very interesting journey going from, you know, the, the design side of things where you just jump in and start writing code through business analysis and into a much more structured way of thinking about what changes are, how they work, and how they fail. Uh, I've also spent a lot of time looking at human nature and how that affects our ability to change and our ability to stay the same, to remain stable and resist change. Both are important. So I take a very behavioral, human psychological point of view to a lot of the work that I do. I also do consulting, I do public speaking about change and and transformation, and I'm particularly interested in the relationship that people have with technology and how it's misunderstood and often misrepresented. And, And I care about that because that limits our ability to change and to alter our organizations effectively. So that's sort of my perspective. Now. Uh, As this is our first episode, I'm actually going to tweet that we are uh, broadcasting episode one being live right now. So I have to look down at my keyboard and I can't talk while I do that because, you know, my neck. Fire away. So while you're you're doing that, uh, I actually wanted to comment on one of the things you mentioned is that you're moving from a more development-oriented uh, focus through business analysis then on to human behavior. Because I've seen the same thing over the course of my career. You know, I stuck, stuck, as a BA, I was primarily focused on the technical aspects of change, right? Understanding what the requirements were for a new solution, figuring out what that solution would look like, how it would work, what it would do, and then, you know, kind of deploying that out to all the people in the business saying, there you go, there's your new solution. And in the years I've, when I've moved into more executive position, when I've moved into a more senior set of roles, it's sunk in, as it has for many, many other people over the years, that change is really about people. And, you know, the technical solutions are important, but they're secondary. And it's always the way people react to change that will make or break it. Yeah, it's so tempting to try to simplify people out of the equation. You know, when I used to work in retail many years ago, I would say, you know, this job would be so easy if it wasn't for all the customers. And the same is true when you're dealing with organizational change. It would be so much easier if we didn't have to deal with those employees or those customers or the, you know, all the human elements of it. 
one of the things I've been working on recently is a, a different kind of stakeholder analysis model, which instead of focusing so much on um, interest and influence, it's complementary to that. And it focuses on perceived loss and perceived gain and a change. So instead of trying to analyze your stakeholders based on, um, you know, how they can affect you, you analyze them based on what they think is going to happen to them in terms of a change in value. And it leads to really interesting um, observations. Like you can have allies who are against your change. They don't want the change. They just hate the current state so much. They feel they're losing so much today that anything would be better. I think we're seeing some of that in the U.S. elections. That was actually the example that came to my mind, too. Yes, uh, we, I think we definitely are. And, you know, without going into the ins and outs of different policies and offers, you're seeing it on both, you're honestly, you're seeing it on both the Democratic and Republican sides, that there's a yeah. lot of people who just feel the current system is bad for them. And when you have two candidates who are the most unliked candidates, I think, ever, um, you know, running head to head, you there's something weird going on down there. And I find it um, fascinating to compare and contrast with Canada, you know, where we have our uh, PM who's, you know, a babe and everybody seems or most people seem to love him. And, you know, he walks uh, onto the scene and the one of the first things he says is, you know, um, because it's 2016, you know, like we're in the modern era, we're here to change, we're here to have equality in my cabinet, we're here to do this, we're here to end to end. The rhetoric is so different from what we're hearing in the States. Um, you know, Justin Trudeau's cabinet is an example of the kind of team that I would set up. Uh, if I wanted to make an effective organization that's capable of some agility and transformation, what he's done is create a group that is very diverse. Uh, many people are... <laughs> of, course, of course, today is the day where partway through talking, my voice goes all silly. Um, what I was saying was part of what he's done is set up a team that's very diverse and where many of the people who are in charge of a particular domain, it's their area of secondary expertise, not their primary expertise. And what it means is that everybody on the team has to rely on other people on the team for advice. And when you start to build a cohesive team like that, they tend not to be overconfident. They tend not to be overconfident, and they tend to be much more capable of reacting and adjusting to new and changing circumstances. So it's a, um, it's a real recipe for flexibility. Yeah, so while you let your voice recover for a second, uh, let's start to distill that back into, okay, we've talked about the political realm. How do, what does that mean for you as a business? And we've hit on a couple of things. One is that uh, stakeholders have a reaction change based on how it affects them. And so, you know, there, there is the reality that in many cases, when we see people resisting change, it's because they, a they actually don't see a benefit for them in making the change, right? They see it, they perceive a loss. And the reality is that having to come in and relearn your job is a loss for a lot of people, right? You don't know what's going, uncertainty is increases, greatly increases the risk of loss. And we know from um, prospect theory that people react more strongly to avoiding loss than they do to potential benefits. So when you put all this together, it's no wonder that a lot of the time people resist change. And I think you know, prospect theory is one of those areas that really, once you get it, once you understand what it is, it really reveals a lot about how people react to real world problems. So I think maybe we could take it, we should take a moment and talk a bit about what prospect theory is, since I know yeah. a lot of people want to be familiar with the term. Well, Daniel Kahneman um, is a behavioral psychologist. He worked with uh, an economist whose name eludes me at the moment. The first for many, right. For many years, and they developed quite, really, they invented behavioral economics. And 
the big difference between behavioral economics and regular economics is that behavioral economics presumes that humans are not rational, which, uh, you know, is just reflecting reality. So when you look at uh, economics from their point of view, you come up with things where uh, you look at behaviors from an evidence-based perspective. Prospect theory was, uh, they came about because they were looking at how people actually react to losses and gains. And um, what they found was this really neat curve. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, edit it into the video later. But this really neat curve where people react to the losses, as Kevin, as you said, much more dramatically or strongly than they react to gains. And what that means is you can nickel and dime someone to death, but you can't like dollar them to happiness. The, the amount of money or gain that it takes to feel, um, feel rewarded is much more significant than the amount of loss that it takes to feel real pain. And that leads to really strange and human behaviors um, that range from like being pot committed. I've already lost so much. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll bet it all on uh, and, and maybe lose everything. Um, reactions to, to trivial losses that are way out of proportion. Uh, and you can divide up people's losses and gains into different categories. And in some cases, there is no way to pay off a loss or to erase a loss unless it's with the same kind of gain. Like, if I lose money, I can gain money and erase that debt. But if I lose, like, reputation or lose face with my executive team, I can't pay the money to get that reputation back. So there's, there are a lot of complexities to, to how it affects human behavior. But just starting off from that basic idea that, you know, I, my rule of thumb is, uh, you know, one cent loss requires at least a 10 cent gain to balance it out, just as a rough rule of thumb. Yeah. And what was interesting about their experiments is that they really did them very rigorously. Um, what, the way they worked it is that they set up two problems which involved identical amounts of monetary impact, but they phrased one of the problems as, you know, you will make X number of dollars if you go down and you have a couple of options, and the other was you will lose Y number of dollars if you choose one of two options. And what they found was that more people, when it was phrased in terms of loss, they would bet it all and take the possibility that gave them a slim chance of escaping with no loss, whereas when you in terms of winning, the majority of people would pick the sure thing over the high, you know, the high risk, big win. And while, of course, it's different for everybody and different people of different tolerances, it shows how, in general, you can expect people to operate. And, you know, I started applying it years ago when I was teaching project management, because one of the things that you see is behavior in project, in projects. And, you know, I know that Agile probably, Agile methods probably reduce the impact of this, but in traditional kind of waterfall sorts of projects, you get this behavior of people doing crazy things to hit the deadline because to the project manager, winning is coming in on time, you know, on budget and everything else, and failing to hit that deadline is seen as a career failure. So, you know, if there's any chance on big projects that you can hit, still hit that deadline, or you can convince yourself there's a chance, people will, people will take that, and they won't take mitigating actions that would ensure that they run over the original budget, but would probably reduce the amount by which they could go, things could go badly. Yeah, this ties into how incredibly bad humans are at managing risk. We, uh, we're really, really good at managing danger, which is a gut feeling, it's a heuristic, and it's about fear. Whereas risk is a calculation that's much more intellectual and we have no natural capacity for it. You have to do the work and think it through. So, you know, those project managers are working from a position of fear and danger, not of risk and risk mitigation. Even though they're trained in risk and risk mitigation, that's not how they react in their own 
um, like on their own when they're trying to manage their own piece of work. And you see that in all kinds of changes in organizations. Uh, people say they're doing risk analysis, but really they're, they're doing danger analysis. They're doing gut-based fear analysis and acting based on those things instead of, uh, instead of based on real risks. And when that happens, that's setting you up for a failure. Either you fail to, to initiate a change because you're too afraid of what the consequences would be, or as you're making a change, you fail to take the appropriate actions to, to manage the risks associated with it and then, uh, you know, running way over budget or over time, which, I mean, that never happens, right? Yeah. yeah. But when you couple that with other typical human behaviors, such as, you know, the lack of desire to make major alterations that you hope may not be necessary, right? Especially ones that could have a negative effect on your company. And this is where you get into the, the classical disruption mode, right? Where somebody comes and eats your lunch, but you don't make the change because it, at every point, it seems like you're going to have to take a big loss to adapt to, you know, a new business environment. And the result is that, of course, you know, when we say people resist change, well, of course they resist change uh, because they don't see a reason to change until the, until it gets to the point where the, the need is obvious. I think it's more accurate to say people resist loss. They don't resist change. They resist loss because people seek out gains. You know, if there's a clear opportunity to... Uh, to to make more um, more profit on a on a product, and no particular downside. You're moving into a new market with no significant differences from your existing market. There's no big risk. There's no you know big chance of failure. You're just gonna do it. Now that's a change, and it's not one that you your organization would have a lot of internal resistance to, because it's a change that is a gain. You know. Moving into China when you're a, a Canadian company and have no real understanding of how the Chinese market works, maybe there's some risk there, maybe there's some fear, and there's really a lot of potential loss, and so maybe you avoid that. You know, well, we'll deal with that later. We we have other things to, to do right now, even if it's a huge opportunity. Maybe, although interestingly enough, I suspect you'd find that a lot of people would except that kind of opportunity, one where they don't really understand the risks and downsides involved, but it looks like pure upside. So that's an important clarification, right? If you're misinformed or don't understand your actual situation, then you do lots of things that are, that, you know, in retrospect, you might regret. Right. So and I'm not fact. talking about any of my ex-girlfriends. I wasn't even going to go there, but to bring it back to even the project side of things, right? That's that's where you start off with wild optimism. At the early, in the early days of the project, it's like this will be yes. easy. Come on, it's oh, great. Oh yeah, we've done this before. This will be no problem. And now we're using agile, so it's just go. What could possibly go wrong? Well, you know, you know better than to invoke Murphy like that. <laughs> So, in a, you know, when we talk about, you mentioned disruption. I think it's an overused term in many cases, but there have been real transformative moments where the, like a marketplace is being completely transformed, where it's being um, overrun by, by a new organization or invented with a new product. I mean, Twitter invented something. Facebook invented something. So did Google. So has Apple. Right, like they created entirely new markets. Those are enormously disruptive. And then there are, um, you know, organizations and markets that have failed to change to, to keep up with the times, especially I would say newspapers and magazines in the case of, you know, dealing with the internet. So, um, you know, I think there's a, an example of organ, organizations where not only have they like failed to change, they've, they've actively resisted any kind of, uh, adaptation to take advantage of some of the new opportunities and you know it's, it's one thing to, to observe that and say yeah I've seen it and, and oh the newspapers are dying it's another to try to figure out what could they have done differently 
and you know, how are their success stories? Like the New York Times is still doing okay. They've chosen a very different model than than most magazines. And they're a powerhouse with a reputation that allows them to have a paywall that, like other organizations, can't replicate. So what does, you know, McLean's do or, you know, um, Time or others, you know, other organizations that are supposed to be producing news but no longer have, like, the ad-based revenue streams that they used to have? So, I mean, I don't have a, a solid answer. I think one thing that they would be very um it would be very useful if they were to disconnect their publication like the actual printing and distribution uh arms from their organizations like sell the printing press and i can't imagine that any of those organizations are willing to do that because they're falling prey to a sunk cost fallacy you know like we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on printing presses and are you saying get rid of them right so you know th that's a, that's a good example so let's unpack some of what you were just talking about there um i agree with you that disruption is wildly overused disruption now people you talk about something being disruptive when it's just competition right i mean you know the theory of disruption as it was set out has a certain number of predictive elements and you know those elements often don't apply right disruption theory it assumes that you're looking at a case where you have a, somebody coming in to the market in a certain way with a certain approach uh that where the reasonable and logical response of existing incumbents is to not respond because they have they actually it's not initially a big threat to them. It's only as the new method, new approach gains steam that they really run into a situation where it becomes a problem. You know, the exa good example being Blockbuster versus Netflix, right? At, when it started off, Netflix was just this kind of mailing DVDs around, and that really didn't seem to be a danger to Blockbuster stores. You know, Blockbuster had deals that made sure they had all the great hits. And it was only as Netflix got bigger and bigger and got more and more you know, s stuff on its service that it became a real threat to Blockbuster. And by then it was too late for Blockbuster to adapt. Now, do you think Blockbuster could have adapted? Like, they, they eventually started mailing out DVDs, didn't they? Well, they turned down an opportunity to buy Netflix, as I recall. Oh, I didn't know that. I did not yeah. know that. Interesting. So, you know, could they have? Yes. And in fact, there, there, are, there are quite a few companies that have successfully Adapted. But let's go back to, you know, your newspaper example, because they're a great instance of an industry that is facing massive change. Um, we also see similar things with music stores, right, where I try to find a try to find a record shop today. There's one that just opened up down the road for me. Um, but, you all know, they're what's that? Are they all vinyl? Yeah. So it's they're they're not banking on music; they're banking on nostalgia. Yeah, or that particular, or they're going they're going for a very niche market, right? But the ma the mainstream record stores, uh, the yeah. I remember, they're gone. All, yeah, and newspapers ran to a similar problem because what happened is that you know the old newspaper model, the old news media model, was essentially you know advertising pays for the news, and you put a firewall between the news and that at advertising. And the newspaper is basically kind of a wrapper for the classified ads. And then you got Craigslist. And Craigslist, and if you took, take a look at a chart of newspaper industry ad revenues, it just sort of falls off a cliff as Craigslist gains speed. Right. So the traditional three-party market is being disrupted because these, the scarcity that drove that market, which was the capacity to reach a large audience, a mass market, is gone, or rather it's being transferred, the the relative cost of reaching that market has fallen to zero, or we wouldn't be able to do this, right? And, yeah. and as a result, you end up with um, something that can eat the lunch of the newspapers, quite literally. Um, so we've talked about a couple of things here. One is uh, the theory of disruption. Do you have a, a particular author or a book or something about that, because I hadn't—I uh, know about disruption. I've read about it, but I didn't actually like 
read a specific book about it. Well, what I'm in the process of reading right now is The Disruption Dilemma, I believe, by Josh Gans, because it's a book that actually takes a look at the history of disruption theory, the experiences that I've had, looks at some of the examples, and is kind of making an argument about how it does and does not apply. You know, because the initial... The initial examples, while interesting, we've seen a lot of companies actually start to respond to this and find ways to deal with it. So it's not as impossible as one might think, especially if you recognize that the disruption is happening. Okay, so I'll put that in the show notes, um, that book. And when we're talking about the three-party market and Craigslist and so on, um, there are a couple of books, but Kevin Kelly... um, wrote an essay many years ago um i'm just making a note here to also put in the show notes the essay was called better than free and it was talking about um the the things that are valuable when you when the the uh, traditional supply and demand uh equation breaks down like what what happens when there's no scarcity supply and demand for setting price, that whole theory doesn't work when the supply is essentially infinite, which is the internet, right? That's music, that's podcasts, that's data transfer, that's, uh, you know, newspapers, that's news. It's affecting all of those things. And traditional economic theory has some trouble with that. Where thing, where you do find value is not in the base product. It's on something about that product. And I did a bunch of analysis on that a few years back. And one of the things that I found was that value becomes um, an assessment (laughs) not so much of what the product can do or its basic functionality, but of what it says about you or an experience that it gives you. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly that's I think that's exactly right. And, you know, when you go when you take a look at, say, news media, the problem is that the advertising model online is pretty, pretty ugly unless you radically change the way you work. You see companies like BuzzFeed that are successful in a new media platform. You know, they typically have a much smaller staff than the major newspapers because not only do you have the problem of. You know, classified ads moving on to things like Craigslist. You even have the more mainstream advertisers, the brand advertisers, looking at things and saying, okay, you know what? We'll put some ads on your site. And, you know, this is something I actually read about in another story, and I don't have the notes available. But an ad executive is saying, what we're going to do is we're going to put the ads on this site that we know gets the audience we want. And we're going to put cookies on those ads. We're going to track the other websites they go to. That, and then we'll figure out which one costs the least to advertise on, and that's where we'll put that's where we'll put our stuff because we now have all this information about what our audience wants to look at. Right. It's it's really um, it's starting to change. The advertising industry is still struggling to make use of the data that they have, but there are those those initial forays in there where they're starting to take advantage of the big data. And when you talk about a company like BuzzFeed. One of the things that they've done is disconnect from um, the idea of having like one website where I go to read the news. That whole paradigm is like buying a magazine where I uh, consume my news from, like it's one collected source. What BuzzFeed has done is said, you can come to our site, but we don't care. What we want to do is we'll go to where you are. So, like, I've never been to the BuzzFeed site, I don't think, but I've read lots of BuzzFeed articles on Facebook, and I've seen lots of links on Twitter. So, like, they've they've disconnected one piece of the traditional uh, thinking. They've disconnected from that completely and are approaching it from a different perspective that's not attached to that. Uh, I have to bundle it up and package it as a magazine idea. It's fascinating. Right. And there's another person to think about, Jeff Jarvis, who's on uh, the the Twit Network a lot and has written a bunch of books um, like What Would Google Do and uh, Gutenberg the Geek. Um, He's talked a lot about this kind of stuff because he's a journalism professor and thinks about those kinds of things. 
And Clay Shirky is another one who uh, is fun to listen to. And it's very, very interesting ideas about how these markets can work. Yeah. So, but, so to bring this back to what we were talking about earlier, though, you know, when you're presented with this kind of fundamental sh- shift where the business model you had no longer works, what does that do to the people who work in that industry? Because, you know, if you're a journalist, you have a very clear self-image of what you do, what the value you provide to the world is and why it's important. And all of a sudden, here's, you know, this whole thing coming along and sweeping that out from under you. And A, you know, do you have a place in that new world as a journalist? And B, how do you replace that co- the function that a relatively independent news media could serve? And there, so, you know, I think this, there are a lot of people trying to solve that problem, but it it's no wonder that newspapers were kind of slow to pick up on it on this because there isn't an obvious way to continue to be who they thought they were in that kind of environment. So, so this is where we get into framing. Um, The way that newspapers and magazines have uh, framed their own perception of themselves is around um, like gathering the news, but it's also around distributing. Like there's a huge amount of it. That's about the broadcast and the distribution. Those are decoupled now, whether we like it or not. Those are like those those things have been largely separated. Journalists could still be journalists, and I think there's a business model there where they can be paid and paid well to be journalists and do real investigative journalism and be independent, um, be you know the the fourth estate. But they can't do that and also be broadcasters in the same way that they used to be, like going out to mass media. They can't rely on advertising revenue in the same way that they used to because there's other ways to, to serve ads and there's other ways to, um, like, the, the, their market, uh, their audience is so distributed. But what if you set up a service? Like, what if the New York Times tomorrow or the Washington Post or whatever tomorrow um, said we're not publishing anything ever again, but other news outlets distributors can buy our journalism now you have um like now you can have people who can be paid they're selling like a b2b sales um you know the associated press does something like this although they do as i understand it more distribution and not as much original journalism but i think that there's like there's a business model there that isn't being uh, isn't being taken care of or isn't being um, used effectively. I, I don't know. Like, I'm sort of that's off the top of my head. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, actually, Facebook is doing something along those lines. They have a program now with publishers where, you know, that's they true. essentially create Facebook native content. Because, yeah. And the reason that can work, although, and the New York Times actually signed up with them for this, right, is that Facebook has enough control over the, an audience that they can command, I think, a certain level of ad rates. But, you know, we're, between, I'm not thinking that we necessarily need to solve all the problems of journalism, but I think what we can do when we're talking about change is ask ourselves, okay, so let's say that you're a business leader in an industry that's going down this path. How do you create conditions for successful change in your organization if you're faced with, you know, looking at, you look down the road and you see that in, 10 or 15 years, your industry won't exist in a recognizable form. So there's a couple of things that come to mind. I mean, the first thing is that you should hire us to help. No, no. The first (laughs) thing, the first thing really is you need to take the time and expend the energy to really understand your own business model the way it is today. Because if you don't know your own business model, and it's shocking how many organizations really don't understand their own business model. If you don't understand that, then it's very hard to understand what pieces can be disconnected or uh, which pieces are going away. Like the news industry doesn't own the, that doesn't really understand their own business model. The music industry doesn't either. And as a result, they're not able to see where change might be possible, even radical change, or let alone simple change. I'd say the second thing is to start 
preparing your internal stakeholders now. Like, even if you think that it, nothing's going to happen for five years or ten years, um, things can happen much more quickly. And setting up your organization so that they understand that change will happen um, and start them practicing changing with, I'm thinking, smaller projects or um, discussions about what the future will look like what kind of loss those people experience and what kinds of gain they would experience. Having those conversations early and making them normal would really help with shifting the mindset, uh, the corporate culture, to being able to adapt um, when it comes time to really do the big hard work. What do you think? Well, so yeah, I th and so let's decompress one of those things because the first thing you mentioned was understanding your real business model. And I think that you're right in that a lot of people don't understand their business model in the sense that they don't understand what are the pieces that really generate value for certain, for their customers, right? And what are the, because quite often the things that you think are important aren't really where the value lies. And I've been, in a, uh, we've both been in a lot of those conversations where we're talking to a group of stakeholders and there's, you know, you're saying that basically they're insisting that this piece of it is critically important. And the reality is, well, it's critically important to a, cer a certain group of people, but not to everybody, right? right. Or, right. you know, the organization, or you have organizations that have a lot invested in a certain way of operating. And the problem is that some things you're heavily invested in aren't going, aren't the things that are going to last for the long term. Right. And what, so, yeah, you have to be able to figure out which pieces can you can you decouple, and there are different methods for doing that. You could do business mo model canvas. There's also a technique called Wardley mapping, and I'll send you over a link on, on that one, which tries to decompose technology all the way from you know the top end user needs down to the pieces of value change and see where where things are moving, with the idea that being that you know various technologies over time tend to go from being custom built to being kind of sold as a product to being more of a utility, right? And then essentially a commodity. Okay. And, you know, and so for instance, if you just look at over the last decade or so, what we've seen with social media, right? You had site, we started off with growing our own social media sites on a lot of places. And over time it went from, okay, then people started giving you products that you could plug in. So you're not coding your own stuff to now, you know, most social media activity happens through a set of things, right? Yeah. And ultimately, it may just be like, this is what it is. And you ha if you want to do social media, you just go straight to Facebook or whatever, or two or three companies, and they own the entire market. Yeah. And so now you're, you're making me think. It's terrible of you. Um, I wonder if... The, the the way that Facebook okay so the way Facebook is looking at social media right now is to start to fragment out um, different specific services like Facebook Messenger is no longer part of the Facebook app Facebook um, you know they bought uh, they bought a, another messenger service they bought different things and it seems that they're doing that with the intent of um, like separating out different forms of relationships or different methods, uh, different mediums for relationships so that they can corner different markets. Because like the the blogger market, uh, they don't serve that very well. The, but, you know, something like Medium does that. Facebook, though, is, you know, taking a real run at Twitter and... Um, taking a real run at, at all the, the various um, chat applications with Messenger and by buying into that because so many people communicate that way. Hmm. I wonder... Um, I wonder what they think, <coughs> like what Facebook thinks its business model is. Clearly they think they have one. Um, but I wonder yeah, what they, where, where they think they deliver value. Right, and to today, their business model is built around advertising. You know, they're to a certain extent also built around online games. Uh, 
with the chat box coming in, you're starting to see potential customer service applications, right? But, you know, I think overall, Facebook's strategy is to be kind of the center, you know, the front page of the internet, I've heard it referred to, right? Yeah, I think their Where, overriding what, strategy is to um, eliminate all friction in relationships. Like, if there's any barrier, whether it's distance or time or language, um, that prevents people from interacting in a rich and full way, they want to kill that. They want to erase that. So, like, that's why they've got Oculus Rift, right? It's not because they think VR is great. It's because that's a, a barrier. A distance is a barrier to good relationships, and they want to they get rid of that. And now, right, making money at the same time, um, like, can you sell ads in VR? I mean, sure, but maybe there's going to be, um, maybe they're going to look to monetize in a different way. Um, whether it's something like, like the, the app market, um, business applications, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but now I'm very curious. Yeah. But I think what we actually see here is, you know, that second step that you talked about earlier in, in action. Right. So what is the future of social media? I don't know. I don't know any, but I don't think anybody knows, you know, it's still a very, very young form of communication. We, it, we have, we don't know. And a company like Facebook that has the money that Facebook does has the wherewithal to experiment with a lot of different approaches and with the expectation that, you know, they'll see what shakes out and they want to be ready to be in there and be competitive no matter what the evolution ten happens to be. So, so Neil Gaiman, I know one of the authors that you really like, he talks about putting guns in drawers. So when you write a story, oh, we're getting a lot of feedback right now. I'm not entirely sure why or if your mic moved, but I'm, uh, I'm hearing a lot of echo. In any case... Neil Gaiman talked about putting guns in drawers. And what he meant was, if you're writing a narrative or setting up a story, you may not know all the twists and turns that are going to come. But what you want to do is create the conditions where no matter where the story takes you, no matter where the characters drive you, you are prepared. There's something there. So if you put a lot of <laughs> guns in drawers in the early chapters, later on, when you need a gun in a drawer, it's there. The plot device is already there. It's like sowing a lot of seeds. I think what Facebook, as you say, is doing is putting guns in drawers. They're setting up conditions where many, many projects or ideas or initiatives could fail. But when the environment changes so that um, what they're doing today isn't working anymore, isn't as effective, they already have something that's adapted to that new condition. Um, I mean, that's how evolution works that's how adaptation of species works it's not that my life like my physical body changes to adapt to a current condition it's that my kid is already mutated so that when there's a drought and they don't need enough or don't need as much water they're better off if it got wetter my kid wouldn't do as well so i think that facebook um is probably taking that kind of approach so many seeds so no matter as you say no matter where the conditions, uh, no matter how the conditions play out, they'll be ready. Right, and that's because if you've got a truly just, you know, a truly shifting and changing and disruptive in the normal English sense environment that you're operating in, where you can't, you know, where you know, you know that there are trends that are going to seriously affect your business, but you don't know exactly what they are, you don't know how they're going to play out, you don't know what else people bring on to see. Right, and what will catch on and what won't, and how, and how and when it will catch on, you you have two fundamental choices. One is you do a bet your business bet on one, and you know in some cases that's not that that's a reasonable idea, especially if you're hoping to own that technology or own that sector, right? And you're you're going to try to win that particular game. But if your real business is something else, and you're not a, you're not trying to own one possible outcome scenario, right? Like, so, you know, the example being, okay, if you're, you could either say, bet, go whole hog on VR, but then you're becoming a VR company. If you're 
a company that's involved in connecting people and, you know, like, say, more professional association, you're not going to bet millions and millions of dollars in building VR stuff. You're going to learn about VR. You're going to learn about other communication things. You're going to have some experiments going so to see which catch on and be prepared to move quickly when it looks like a winner is emerging. Right. That is going to come, that is going to affect how your, your fundamental business models. So back to your question, how is this, you know, long rambling discussion practical for some executive in some company? Well, um, reframing your understanding of your own organization is absolutely critical to being able to prepare for change and to be able to prepare your people for change. And it really is your people that need to be prepared for change. I mean, you can swap out technology um, and it won't necessarily have any effect if the people who are using the technology don't know how to use it right or don't want to use it right or actively um, fight against using it. I've seen all three. I'm sure you've seen all those scenarios too. So um, as a leader, changing the narrative about the, the nature of your business what's important and why it's important. That is uh, a fundamental first step, um, especially if you're trying to prepare for long-term change. So years ago, I worked for Bank of Montreal, and one of the things that that organization did at the time was a big rebranding effort to go from Bank of Montreal to BMO. Now, a part that was because they wanted a name that was shorter and, you know, biffy and could be tweeted and things like that. But it was also part of a larger effort to help the people who worked at that organization understand that there is actually a customer that they're supposed to be serving. And when you're five or six layers back from customer service, you know, working on a mainframe, it can be very hard to see how what you do has, you know, delivers any value to anyone out there who's actually a customer. So it took years. I mean, I left the organization before that, that cultural transformation was even close to done. But we did make a lot of progress. And there was a point where people who, and I mean this literally, like were working on the mainframe. At the start, they, they said, I don't have anything to do with customers. A year or two later, they were saying, well, I mean, I don't have anything to do with customers, except that if I make changes here that don't work, then it really will affect someone. You know, it'll affect the ability of a teller to be able to, to help out somebody looking at a mortgage because, you know, the, the mainframe isn't going to give them the information they want as quickly as they want it or, or whatever. So reframing is not a short-term thing under most circumstances. Um, and as a leader, you need to think very carefully about how you want to uh, how you want your organization's culture to behave around what the organization is. Um, the example I always use for culture is Disney because they have such a, well, I was going to say strong culture. It's, it's almost a cult in terms of how strong the culture is. But they really believe that they are um, inviting you into their home. That's, that's the behavior. You're a guest. You are there um, to feel welcomed and to feel safe. And because that is so profoundly part of their culture, it, uh, it's pervasive everywhere. And when they want to do something related to that, they can do it very quickly. Uh, you were at Disney recently, weren't you? Uh, about a little, somewhat over a year ago uh, for my daughter's sixth birthday. So... I mean, things like the uh, the wristbands that they use now, right? I mean, yeah. you're, you're tagged like cattle, and you like it. Yeah, you can charge everything to your room on those things, too. You just sort of wander, wander around, buying things, not knowing how much you're spending. It's, it's great for Disney. And, and but it I feels... Think that, oh, go ahead. It, yeah, but I think that what you're touching on is part, part of a big issue in terms of reframing, because there's a particular... Um, <clears throat> example people give, and it's very common, very cliched, and I think it's a terrible example, so that's why I'm going to bring it up, is that people love to say, and I have no, I can't remember who originally said it, but, you know, they talk about buggy whip manufacturers, and there is an industry that is entirely extinct, right? And 
the line is that if they had thought if they had thought of themselves being in the transportation industry rather than the buggy whip manufacturing industry, they might still be around. The problem with that is what exactly would make a buggy whip manufacturer tr- transition into building motorcycles, right? So there's, I th- that's the thing. I think there's two things you have to look at. You look at both the value proposition and the benefits that your customers receive, but you also have to understand your capabilities and culture to think about, okay, so if our existing value proposition is going away, what about our company will enable us to win in a new environment with a, di- with a different set of value? I find that same value proposition or a different value proposition that takes advantage of what we are actually good at. Interesting. Uh, and I think that, I mean, depending on the kind of industry you're in, uh, if you can associate your value proposition with one of the generatives that, you know, Kevin Kelly talked about, something about um, who your customer is, like who they think they are or what they experience, you probably have something that is, well, not timeless, but more robust than if you're trying to associate your value proposition with like a function, something, some uh, functional capability that you get by having the product. So like every cell phone out there today, pretty much every smartphone does basically the same stuff. But a person who buys an iPhone or a person who buys a Galaxy phone or a person who buys a Nexus phone they're doing that not for the functionality so much as for what it says about who they are and for um, having a particular experience that they want to have. So strategically, if you can tie yourself to that kind of thing, you're likely to have to be able to build a loyalty to your organization and a mindset in your organization that's focused on something that will persist even as the market changes. Yeah, as long as your capabilities still align to the direction the market is taking, right? And that that is where I think you can see a successful company company t- fail. But but if but oh, if you well, separate they, at least hey, your... just a sec, I wanna to dig into that because well I think what I'm trying to say is that so take Apple, for example. They're focused on giving, uh, giving people a particular experience and uh, letting people feel that they are a certain kind of person, giving the, conferring a characteristic to people who buy their phones or buy their products. As the market changes, if Apple is willing to f- continue to focus on that experience and that, those characteristics that their customers want to, to have, uh, the fashion side of it, in a sense, then I suspect that the organization will remain able to to undergo really significant <laughs> changes in their capabilities because they're not thinking about you know what are what tools do I have already? They're thinking about how can I best create this experience in my market? Like if they build a car. That's radically different from anything else they've done before. They have no capability to build a car historically, and yet they're willing to jump into that by all the evidence that we have so far. And I think they're probably doing that because they're trying to capture that same feeling in a different kind of market. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, but Apple's capabilities revolve around, you know, product design and product experience and enabling, you know, just basically selling high-end products at a significant margin that people are willing to pay more for because either of, you know, the brand associations or low or low friction and uh, usage. I mean, one of the big reasons that I tend to have all Apple stuff is that it works together and it works together not perfectly seamlessly. And, there's, you know, there's been a lot of concern about some slippage on that front, but mostly pretty seamlessly, right? I mean, at this point, I can do stuff on my iPad and pick it up on my Mac and check it out on my phone and I can even look at stuff on my watch if I really want to for some reason, right? right? And that that is a connection that I pay a bit of a premium to get with on the Apple side of things, you know? On the other hand, if you're 
wanting to customize everything your way and have that flexibility, then Android is typically the operating system of choice. So when you talk about Apple as a product company, I think I see where you were going before I rudely interrupted you. Because if Apple was, like if people no longer cared about products for some bizarre reason, um, like Apple wouldn't be able to pivot around people just not caring about having a sexy gadget. If people stop caring about sexy gadgets, Apple's going to collapse. Right, and that's where things like, you know, you, you ask yourself about things like cars and watches and, you know, if, if nothing else, the car ha cars have one big thing going for them, which is that it's a sexy gadget market. Yeah. You know, people do not buy Mazda Miatas or Tesla Model S beca just because of the functionality, right? It's, you know, you want functionality after a certain point, you're not, it's like the Corinthian lever doesn't, just doesn't get that much better, but and you're paying a huge premium on the upper end of the market. I actually worked at an automotive manufacturer at one point, and you know, so I saw all of their pricing sheets. So I saw what it actually cost to make the car versus Interesting. what they pay for it. And I be and believe me, the, pro the higher end of car you buy, the bigger the profit margin. Right? The low end economy cars are pretty slim overall. The luxury cars, the profit margin is huge. It's very interesting. I mean, that, now that makes more sense. It's not me wondering why would Apple want to build a car. And a lot of people wonder that. And this is the, the first conversation I've had or heard where, um, where there's a, a rationale that makes sense. And, and the sexy product market, you know, that, yeah. that's, that's it. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's where a Apple will be looking at now will the apple car ever come out who knows apple has a lot of cash and you know from all i hear they do they run a lot of different experiments and different kinds of things and they're you know if they invest a couple of billion dollars in it and shut it down yeah so they've got they've got more cash they're sitting on everybody. 300 almost 300 billion in cash they can afford to lose some money but at the same time this uh, this idea can apply in any organization even if you're gas strapped, even if you're a smaller shop, or you deal with a lot of internal bureaucracy and trying to get funding and so on, you can still look at ways to uh, to experiment and like to um, in some companies like HP a few years ago, maybe eight or ten years ago, they basically created a, a an innovation division, um, very small black ops almost that really. <laughs> didn't report to the rest of the company in any particular way. Their senior executive, whose name eludes me at the moment, he is a, an innovation podcaster he did for a long time. Um, he spent most of his days defending his group from the rest of the company. That was his job. And as a result, they created Alienware, and like they did, they did stuff and created products that um, really, really made their market happy. And it, it changed some of the ways that HP interacted with their market. But, you know, that was like that was run almost like a as I say, a black op inside the organization, with one executive inside the organization defending it and and uh keeping it safe from the rest of the company that wanted to kill it. So like there are ways to do this even if you're not Apple. And even if you're, you know, somewhere in the middle tier of your, your management hierarchy. You can find there are ways to um, to allow that kind of innovation to incubate and to encourage it, even if you only have control over like a small piece of local culture. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can get people to work with and experiment in that, that space, right? You can direct them to spend a certain amount of their time really getting to understand those markets and those technologies and how they work, particularly if you're not a technology firm. And, then, and that's, I think, one of the big differences, right? Because when we're talking about Apple or HP or even Facebook, they gotta, they're the ones who are trying to build this stuff. And that takes a certain amount of capital. It takes a certain amount sure. of engineering experience. But if you're a company that is, say, I know, 
if you're in the newspaper business or you're in some services business and you're trying to figure out how is this stuff going to affect me down the road, you don't need to be going out and building your own VR kits. You just need to be taking the time and energy to keep an eye on that market to maybe pl- get spend some of your people, ha- let them play with those toys so that they can start to understand them so that if those things take off, they're in a position to grasp them, right? So it's things like looking at social media, looking at tools like Snapchat and trying to understand how it works. Because like most people over 40, I don't understand what Snapchat is at all. Yeah, I I really don't understand it either. You know, and if you're, you know, I thought it was about teenagers um, doing things they didn't want their parents to find out about. But it's from everything I hear, it's much more than that now. Yeah. But, you know, and so, you know, you can do things like set up a Snapchat account and play with it just to figure out what is this thing and why would I use it? And because if you don't, then you're setting yourself up again for failure, especially if you're a content provider, right? Because this is how a significant number of people consume their content. So there's, there's a broader lesson here, which is about like divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And on the, you know, when you, when you walk out into the, the wild world out there and try things like Snapchat or Pinterest or Twitter or whatever, um, you're, you're going divergent. You're trying to explore and you have to expect that a significant number of the things that you explore are not going to be directly profitable or give you any like immediate return. That's not why you explore. You explore so that you have a better understanding of what's available and you can take advantage of, of things that you find. At some point, though, you have to start to converge back in and... Uh, you know, focus your efforts. What you don't want to have is all the people in your team going off and doing only their own things without any coordinating effort or influence. And at some point, you know, if you're managing a portfolio at, at any level, you have to, to draw them back in. I'm smiling because you had to do this with me repeatedly. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, every boss that I've ever had has had to do that with me. Now, that's partly because... I get hired to do divergent thinking and you know that's why it says thinky person you know in my lower third there um so I'm in a position where I've been very lucky that I've been able to do that a lot but at the same time you know you have to be able to as a leader cut away and say no to a lot of things you just don't want to say no too early and you want to make sure that there's always an opportunity for your people to feel rewarded for just discovering things. Yeah, and you need to be prepared to reconsider reconsider certain things because you may see that something, you know, that initially didn't look that promising actually turns out to be much more important than you thought. Uh, a good yeah. example of that would be, you know, and going back to our past experience, right? But on social media, uh, a number of years ago, you know, looking at the different platforms and determining that LinkedIn was by far away much more important than Facebook for terms of getting the message out about yeah. business services. What I'm hearing and what I'm starting to understand is that outside of North America in particular, Facebook has become much more of a business oriented platform in a lot of countries. And a lot of it's used for a lot of professional communication. And so you know, Absolutely. I would at this point in time kind of, if I was dealing with an international messaging, I would probably take another look at that around Facebook and see, you know, is it now valuable enough that you need to reconsider your engagement with it? Well, you know, when when we were setting up this whole Change Fail podcast and website and so on, I mean, we didn't create a LinkedIn page, but we've got a Facebook page. And, you know, even two years ago, uh, I would have done it the other way around. So, you know, the environment's changed and the nature of the platforms has changed a bit and the ease of use has changed. So, you know, we, we need to be willing to, uh, as you say, to adapt and to learn. So I think that's probably a good note to uh, to close on. I think we've been on for like an hour and uh, yapping away. This has been a lot of fun for our, you know, first beta conversation and broadcast. Um, 
there's I've got lots of notes here that I'm going to put into our show notes and and you know do that side of the production. So if you're watching this by the time you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening to this by the time you're listening to it on iTunes, uh, you'll be able to find everything that you want to find at change.fail. That's not change.fail.com. That's just change.fail. And um, anything you want to close with? No, I th- I think that I think that's good. I think we we hit a lot on a number of themes that we're go- probably going to have to revisit over time time to come. Um, I think we're going to have to talk a lot more about how these things fail, though, and why you don't often see why you often don't see companies succeed at making these transitions when a big business change comes along. You mean we were too positive? Yeah, I think we were. But for a cha- for a podcast called Change Fail, we were like we, this is more like Change Success. But 